Great. Well, welcome everyone to this week's Philosophy of Physics webinar. It's our great pleasure to have speaking to us today, Professor Doreen Fraser from the University of Waterloo. Um, some years ago, Doreen did the BPhil in philosophy, I gather on the same year as Chris, um, under the supervision of Simon, um, before going on to PhD at Pitt, and then an illustrious career in the philosophy of physics, in which she's become one of the leading figures in the philosophy of quantum field theory. Um, today, she's going to be talking to us about the philosophical implications of measurement in GFT. So we're all very excited to hear what you have to say, Jordan. Thank you, James, and thank you for uh, having me. So a few years ago, it would be uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> it's been a special pleasure to come back. I'm staying at Wolfson, which is my college, and the corridor on which the guest rooms are happens to be the same corridor where I had a flat. And they haven't really done very much renovation <laughs> in that particular part of the college. There's been a lot of building, but it's nice because you walk in and it feels like you're back in uh, 1998. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Okay, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is a small part of a much larger project that I've been working on over the course of the pandemic um, with um, a number of people, but especially with uh, Maria Papagiorgio, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo in Applied Math, and also doing a co hotel with the University of Patra. So she has three co-supervisors and she's doing this project with me. Uh, so uh, she's uh, been an amazing collaborator and I've learned a lot from her. Um, this is a project that has as I'll talk about in a moment, has both a sort of foundations of physics, more physics -y dimension, has a history of physics dimension, and then I'm going to be talking about the philosophical piece today. So she said not to put her name on this philosophical piece because she doesn't necessarily want to be responsible for what I've come up here and by means of uh, interpretation of what's going on, um, but she's been uh, uh, really uh, uh, a, a huge part of this project, and a, a lot of what I've learned has uh, been because she has taught it to me. Okay, so this is my plan for what I'm going to say today. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time setting up the talk and explaining what exactly it is I'm going to be talking about today um, from both a physics point of view and a philosophical point of view. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about this larger project, which involves uh, surveying different approaches to measurement theory for quantum field theory. Uh, then I'm going to pick one particular very recent proposal, which is in the <coughs> T framework. And then I'm going to highlight a couple of what I take to be the most important uh, interpretive consequences of this particular project. So I said this is a larger project. Um, there's going to be there's papers that are in draft that will be forthcoming soon on your favorite archives. Uh, so one of them will be a philosophy paper, which is based on this talk. Um, one is a larger physics review paper. So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the algebraic QFT version of this project, but the main point of this larger review paper is to do a bit more surveying and compare and contrast of some of the proposals for measurement in QFT. And then there's also a history paper, which is under review right now. Okay, so here's the physics setup for what I'm going to be talking about. So my topic is measurements in QFT, more specifically measurements <laughs> in local regions in QFT. So this is what I take to be the question that I'm going to be addressing. So we have by now, 100 years later almost, a firm grasp on a standard formalism for quantum theory. And we've also, over the course of those decades, developed what's now become a standard formalism for quantum measurement theory. So I have in mind here von Neumann who started this project, we have Luter's rule, and then we have a number of uh, works by Bush and collaborators uh, in which this uh, measurement theory has been well developed. On the QFT side, by which I mean relativistic QFT, we have QFT, and then my question is, what is the counterpart to measurement theory in ordinary quantum mechanics that should go with relativistic quantum theory. So the first question I think this raises is, 
why is this a question at all, right? So good philosophers always ask that question. So why does QFT need its own measurement theory? And I have in mind here particularly local measurement theory. So I think it's important to think here about the historical context of how quantum electrodynamics in particular developed historically. Um, Alex Bloom has a very nice paper in which he explains the history of how QED developed a scattering theoretic uh, measurement theory as part of the framework of QED. Um, so he it's, uh, has a very nice title, this paper, that the state is not abolished, but it withers away. Um, and what he means by that is that the instantaneous state or sometimes a stationary state that's central to uh, representation and measurement theory, in particular in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, didn't really transfer very well to QED. Uh, and so eventually this resulted in the adoption of um, asymptotic scattering theory of QED. So this means that you have infinitely early times and infinitely late times as an idealization. Um, so I have to be careful here. This doesn't obviously, obviously that's always an idealization. I don't think we ever measure anything infinitely early or infinitely late. But the point here is that this is a much different setting on the theoretical side for how we represent measurement. So part of what I'm asking here today is, can we now looking at quantum field theory from today's perspective, ask about how you would formulate, formulate a proper local measurement theory for QFT, where on the theoretical side, you're trying to get rid of this idealization. There's also an important dialectical context here, which well, there'll be more about this in the review paper I was mentioning. I'm not going to go into this, but this is a very interesting story. Um, there's a old paper from Raphael Sorkin from 1993, in which he presents what he calls an impossible measurements problem for, quantum, well, it's not for quantum field theory. It's for a very minimal relativistic uh, framework for quantum theory. Um, so you might wonder, why not just take the quantum measurement theory we know and love from non-relativistic quantum mechanics and just plunk it on top of quantum field theory and use that as our measurement theory. Well, one reason for that is it turns out that there are scenarios in which you have uh, superliminal signaling happening if you just do that straightforwardly. So this is a diagram of one of those type of scenarios from a more recent paper. So the idea here is um, uh, region 01 and region 03 are space-like separated. Um, we assume we assume microcausality or local commutativity, which means that if you just had O1 and you just had O3, then there would be no problem with signaling. But it turns out that if you um, introduce a non-selective measurement in region O2, it's kind of intervening between those two, but bounded, then you uh, have a situation in which um, the expectation values for observables in O3 are dependent on which unitary operator you choose the parameter for it that you choose in O1. So it means that you can um, use that parameter to, uh, to signal. So clearly, we are going to take it as a given that we don't want superluminal signaling happening in relativistic quantum field theory. Finally, the third reason why we need such a uh, measurement theory is really practical. Uh, and this is, I think, the explanation for why we've had such a uh, boom in activity in this area in really actually just the last few years. There's been a lot of work on measurement theory in uh, relativistic QFT, and that's because it matters because of quantum information, um, which has largely been done using non-relativistic quantum mechanics and its measurement theory as a basis for modeling um, information theoretic communication tasks of quantum systems. But then this raises the question, of course, when we're talking about communication, we want to make sure that we're respecting relativity as we get more detailed and more fine-grained in our description of what the processes are that you're dealing with. So that's another um, reason why there's now this field called relativistic quantum information in which the Sorkin problem has been uh, influential, but also there, there's more um, uh, effort and uh, interest practically in making sure that we have a measurement theory that is, well, obviously in this context, you carry your measurements are being made locally as well, um, but in which you can uh, describe adequately uh, relativistic communication tasks. Okay, so that's the uh, physics context. Now I'm going to switch to talking about why um, the uh, what the philosophical context we're going to be talking about is. So the first point is that I'm going to be talking about measurement in 
uh, in quantum field theory. Um, there have been a lot of philosophical debates about which formulation of quantum field theory is, uh, so for example, the algebraic formulation or the mainstream formulation that we should be using as a starting point for philosophical analysis. Um, so that's actually not the main issue I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to be focusing as a concrete example on the algebraic QFT version of measurement theory for QFT, but actually I don't have time to give this full argument in this short talk, but um, I think the interpretive morals I'm going to draw actually generalize to other versions of measurement theory for QFT that have been very recently proposed. Um, more fundamentally, um, the need for local measurement theory is a need from both the algebraic QFT side, right? So there's been a gap until this recent work uh, that I'm going to discuss, which has been in the last couple of years, and also on the mainstream QFT side. It's not like it's a special problem for one approach. Another important part of the philosophical context is that there's been excellent work in philosophy, including by people in this room, done for many years on the question of interpretations of quantum theory and whether they are compatible with relativity, special relativity or not. So uh, peaceful coexistence there is, in, uh, um, is a reference to uh, Abner Shimoni, of course, was one of the people that has was uh, invested uh, in, uh, in doing work in this area. But the point I want to make here is uh, the general strategy that many have applied is to start with non-relativistic quantum mechanics and its interpretations, and then ask whether extensions to quantum field theory are possible. So uh, to give you some concrete, very recent examples, um, there's recent uh, papers by David Wallace and Emily Adlam. I think actually David mentioned he gave that paper here uh, recently, um, taking this approach and asking this kind of question. I would take uh, attempts at Fomian quantum field theory to also be in uh, this uh, general kind of tradition and adopting this strategy. Um, what I want to do today is look at the same question of how you interpret a relativistic quantum field theory and its measurement, uh, but from another angle, right? So, and actually, this is an, this is why I think this work on measurement in QFT is really interesting philosophically because the angle I'm going to be talking about, I think, is only actually really starting to be available now in physics. So obviously, as philosophers, we really expected to look at this material until it actually exists. Um, so here's the sort of big picture idea I have here. The reason why it's interesting for philosophers to look at measurement theory for QFT, local measurement theory, is that that allows us to start with QFT, develop an appropriate relativistic formalism for representing measurement, and then interpret that package, right? Then interpret QFT plus its measurement theory. And then, of course, there's going to be some sort of correspondence to the interpretations, some of them anyway, that we know and love from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But that's kind of that's taking what we have now and looking backwards as opposed to doing the best we can and trying to project forwards. And of course, you can't talk about measurement without talking about big quantum theory, without talking about the measurement problem. So uh, one of the things that I want to discuss up front is the, the work that I'm going to be talking about um, is in physics is dedicated to uh, trying to solve the problem of how to formulate in physics uh, properly a measurement theory for quantum field theory. Um, so solving the interpretive problem, solving the measurement problem, is not the goal of this work in physics. Um, however, of course, from this philosophical perspective of this talk, that's really what we're going to be interested in at the end of the day as philosophers, um, as uh, the product of this work. So here's the picture of how I think about what's going on here. So as I said, on the, on the non-relativistic quantum mechanics side, we have both non-relativistic quantum mechanics and its quantum measurement theory. And this is what spawned the initial versions of the measurement problem that then iterated and, and uh, proliferated. And now there's many different versions of the measurement problem. But this was a, the initial starting point for being worried about the thing that we call the measurement problem, or initially did. Um, there's, a, I think, an exactly analogous situation that we can now start to describe on the QFT side, which is you have some formulation of relativistic quantum field theory that's articulated, then you add a measurement theory to that, and then, so the first question mark is, okay, so what is that measurement theory? That's the local measurement theory, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in the talk, and then that's going to output something over here. The point I want to stress is, I think, 
what's exciting about this work of philosophers is there's no reason why the measurement problem as we know it in non relativistic quantum mechanics needs to transfer over exactly to relativistic quantum field theory. So I'm not saying the measurement problem gets solved by thinking about measurement theory in relativistic quantum field theory, but I am saying that we can expect, and I'm going to be giving an argument for this at the end of the talk, that the form that the measurement problem takes is going to be different in this relativistic context. Okay, so that is the physics setup. That is the philosophy setup. Now that we're clear what I'm going to be talking about, let me introduce measurement theory. Okay, so as I said, this is an area which has received a lot of attention from different uh, research communities in the last, actually just within the last maybe five years. Although in the history paper, we describe um, a precursor to some of these approaches, which go back uh, longer than that. Um, so I put a bunch of options on here because one of the things I want people to take away is that there's not just one way of doing this, and I think it's going to be valuable to look at different approaches to uh, formulating measurement theory, to compare them, and to try to use that as a way to understand what's going on here. I'm going to flag two of them because they are quite different in spirit and are nice to illustrate the range of approaches that we have in this area now. So the first approach is something that Dan uh, has worked on, uh, and it's uh, what's uh, known as a detector-based detector measurement theory. Um, so the main strategy of this approach to modeling measurement in QFT is to use quantum field theory to, to model the system. So this would be mainstream quantum field theory. And then um, couple the system, that system to a detector, and then you're going to use non-relativistic quantum mechanics to model the detector. So you can think paradigm case, unruh DeWitt detector of a two-level quantum system. Um, and then we're going to model measurement of the detector using as much as we can of measurement theory from uh, quantum mechanics, quantum measurement theory. In particular, projective measurements on the detector that we uh, um, represent using non-relativistic quantum mechanics are allowed. Um, so to give you an idea of what this looks like once you work it all out, you might wonder how does this address that Sorkin problem I was telling you about where if you just apply quantum measurement theory, then you get signaling happening. Um, well, so once you have a concrete detector that you've specified and you've coupled it with a concrete coupling to a specified system, then you have a model that you can do calculations with, right? So then it turns out that if you judiciously choose how you're gonna smear everything and, and the couplings for the system and the detector, then you can calculate what regimes there are going to be in which the uh, signaling is negligible. There's always going to be signaling. It's a pragmatic approach, right? Practically, there's always going to be signaling because you've coupled the non-relativistic thing to a relativistic thing. So you can't get rid of it entirely. But you can show that, say, it's to fourth or higher order in uh, your perturbative <laughs> expansion, but you only care about order two, right? So that that's the sense in which you can show that it's negligible. Can I ask you, you, you consider yeah. a detector which has an extent in a space-like direction. Is that right? The signaling, so I'm an astronomer, so I can yeah, yeah. Sense. Um, So the signaling property that you're talking about arises because the detector has a finite extent, which is space-like. And I wonder if it's actually absolutely essential to think that that's the case. Because within the detector, different parts of the detector are also causally unlinked. Yes, so that is an excellent question. And that's uh, something that we talk about in the longer review paper um, that I was talking through that I, I mentioned. Um, so the short version of this question is, the, the answer to this question, and there's a lot to say here actually, because there's a lot of parameters you put in, right? So you have to interpret the switching and the smearing and, and uh, you want to also be thinking about covariant representations of all of these things. Um, so that makes the, there's a lot to say about how you interpret all of that that's going on. But um, one of the sources of the signaling is going to be the fact that the detector is has, is finite in extent, as you suggested. So um, so, sorry, there seem to be three aspects. The detector is, you said, something like two levels. So it sounds like it's a finite quantum system. Mm -hmm. You also said non-relativistic. Right. Uh, but you've also got 
space-like extent being underpinning these sad but negligible superluminal effects, so, right? Right. So, um, uh, so what gets tricky is you're going to smear. There's going to be smearings, and there's going to be um, uh, couplings, and then you're going to be switching your interactions on and off, typically. Um, so uh, um, uh, there's some subtleties in how you interpret this once you think about all of that. I think the best way to interpret it is to think of it as being all attributed somehow to both the detector and the quantum field theory system all taken together in this representation. Um, yeah. Um, but so I think the main point though here I want to make is um, these are not these are subtle points of interpretation um, and that, that a lot goes into setting up these models, right? So this is a non-trivial like, modeling exercise where the details are important. Um, okay, so the next purple uh, highlighted one is what I will call the FB fair framework, which refers to uh, the Fuster and Berk measurement framework for algebraic quantum field theory. I have a reference in a couple of slides when I can talk to that about that one in more detail. And so what I want to just do here is contrast at a high level what the strategy here is for doing this a modeling of the measurements. So this is an approach in which you use QFT to model both the system and the probe and the coupling between them. So this is a, this is a, a situation which you have, you're going to have an algebra that you associate with the uh, system and an algebra you associate with the probe. And then you're going to have to do the hard job of figuring out what the appropriate measurement theory is to add on top of this structure. So I'm going to talk about that in some detail about how that goes. Um, but just to give you a sense of how this compares with the option I was just telling you about, this is a way of setting things up where everything is done using quantum field theory and it's all as we know and love, nice and rigorous and nice. So you can show uh, quite, it's actually the proof is only a couple pages long. It's very simple that once you set things up this way, super luminal signaling is not possible in principle. Right? When, you, when you set up the, the Sorkin type uh, scenarios I was showing before. Okay, so there's other things I have up here. Please read the review paper. Some of this is going to come up there. But um, the point I want to leave you with, though, is I'm not pushing here for the FB framework over the other options. There are lots of different ways of going here. Um, but I will talk about the FB framework because um, I, some of the interpretive morals I want to draw are clear in this particular approach, even though, as I say, I think the argument could be made that similar interpretive conclusions hold for other approaches. Okay, so in the warm up, um, I'm going to start by reminding you. I feel like five thirty. All right, so as a warm up, I'm going to start by reminding you about the old fashioned operational interpretation of algebraic QFT that goes back to Hogg and Kessler's original paper back in 1964, where they set out this particular interpretation of AQFT. Okay, so this is an interpretive part. This is the sort of talk where I started off with very big picture kind of interpretive points, framing points. I'm gonna come back to interpretation at the end. I'm gonna give you a, bit, a gloss of what's going on in the measurement theory. If you have trouble following it, uh, tune back in at the end when I get to the interpretation and just take for granted what I say if you if you if you lose me and uh, and then you'll still get the interpretive points at the end. Okay, but let's start off by thinking about how we understand how uh, measurement works in algebraic QFT. And so there's this operational interpretation. Okay, so the strategy we adopt to represent quantum field theory systems using AQFT is we assign local algebras as observables to regions of space time. So O is a region of space time, uh, open bound a region of space time. And then we have these algebras of observables we, uh, we um, uh, associate with regions of space time. And crucially, what the axioms are doing is they're ensuring that the way we assign these algebras is compatible, consistent with the principles we take from quantum theory and also the ones we take from special relativity. Um, so, uh, 
what interpretation we give to this, if we're talking Kessler, is we say, okay, this uh, each of these algebras defined on a say some space time region O represents operations that you can in principle perform in O. Right. So if you have a lab in O, that represents operations that you can perform in O. And then the thought is that there's a kind of Heisenberg picture representation uh, when there's no interventions on your system, right? So that we've assigned these algebras and observables to regions of space time. Space time includes time. So you think, okay, that, that's what's carrying the dynamics, right? So dynamics, dynamics is carried by the operators and not the states. Then if you want to do a measurement, say, or some other sort of operation, external intervention, then that's going to be modeled by uh, an algebraic state update. So um, omegas are always going to be algebraic states um, from omega to omega primed. So all of this, though, is very abstract, right? If you told me, if you, if you gave me a certain local lab operation, I could not tell you how to associate it with anything in any of these algebras. Okay, so this is why it's not good enough as a local measurement theory for AQFT. You might think, okay, we've already got one of those, but the point is you don't. And that's why Huster and Merrick have to go on and do a whole bunch more work as we're going to see. The other point I really want to stress, um, which is kind of interesting historically, but that's the other paper. Um, so you might wonder then, okay, if this is totally abstract, how does it connect to predictions? Not surprisingly, it's through asymptotic scattering theory again. So essentially, this is a different way of physically interpreting what empirically amounts to um, asymptotic scattering theory. So these local observables are always going, you're going to have a proper rigorous version of scattering theory, but that, that's going to be how you relate everything to particle masses and collision cross sections, as they say in this original paper. The historically interesting part is this is the, where Hogg started doing his work, so it's not surprising that this continues to be a theme throughout his entire career. Okay, so as an aside, um, there's already problems with this whole interpretation. Um, so um, for, there's some sort of conceptual problems when you think through carefully what this story I just told. So Laura has a really good uh, critical discussion of this kind of interpretation in chapter five of her book, which I recommend. Um, but I'm going to move on to thinking about measurement theory. And so the point I'm going to come back to at the end interpretively is that this picture is not going to be the picture we're going to hang on to once we have a proper measurement theory for AQFT. Okay, so the, the, the interpretation we're going to get of the new measurement framework is going to depart significantly from this interpretation. Okay. So I'm going to step you through the main moves in the setup of this measurement theory for algebraic and field theory. Um, so the two references I have here, the first, the 2020 reference is the original paper in this, which this was first presented. The second reference is a paper that was posted a couple of weeks ago in the archive, which is much recommended because it's shorter and it's clearer and it's, it's an encyclopedia article. So I would start there. Uh, I mean, not with the second paper, but you need the second paper for something. Okay, so first, before you get to talking about measurement theory at all, you have to specify what version of algebraic form of field theory you're going to use. So I'm not going to go through all of this. I'm just going to flag the differences between this set of axioms and the usual axioms you might be familiar with from, say, Hogg, um, and, uh, and then the time slice properties on there because it's the key one for thinking about signaling. OK, so um, really, this way of thinking about uh, quantum field theory is oriented in projects which are looking ahead to like quantum gravity, right? So, um, the space time uh, um, structure that we're going to be dealing with is a general globally hyperbolic space time. So we're not stuck in Minkowski space time as a kind of first step. Um, more significantly, this is called locally covariant uh, AQFT. So part of the idea here is that um, you can compare different dynamics, you can compare the states, right? The same dynamics on different space time structures using this kind of framework. So that's one of the things they're trying to do here. It means that there's actually collections of globally hyperbolic space times that come into the axiom if you do this properly, but we don't need that complication here. Okay, so that's one important <clears throat> uh, generalization. The second one is that we're going to be uh, assigning star algebras instead of C star algebras to our systems. 
And the reason we're going to be doing that is because we want to have field ones. Okay, so we want to have uh, tolerant of operator value measures. We don't want to just be, it, uh, we want to be taking projective measurements as a special case, like you do in quantum measurement theory. Okay, and then the time slice property. Um, uh, so N and M here, so M is, uh, is our global space time. Um, N is a subregion of our global space time. So the time slice property tells us if N contains a Cauchy surface for M, then uh, the two are equal, which means that there's a uh, local embedding isomorphism between the two. So what this axiom is doing is it's abstractly, it's abstractly imposing the condition that you have to have some dynamics. Um, and so this is going to be doing a lot of work for us in our formulation of measurement theory. This is also going to turn out to be the key one if you look at the paper in which they argue that there's no signaling. This is the thing they need to establish that. Sorry, Doreen. Yeah. Uh, could I just ask it? I mean, star algebra, I forget. Doesn't it, but they doesn't have to have bounded. They're not all bounded. Then. Yeah. Right. So, so in particular, your, your N might not be a bounded. Oh, so, um, so I mean, they're envisaging unbounded regions and unbounded operators. Um, are they all, are all the regions? The, all the regions are going to be bounded. Yeah. Okay, but the algebra elements aren't always bounded operators. Uh, well, so gonna, you're going to allow POVMs in, into your into your algebra, and not just oh. and, and not just the self joint operators. But they'll be bounded. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is what I'm. I mean, some star algebra is bounded in some room. Well, they are, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. <laughs> well, um, so that's a question. So I think so. The, the main reason we're doing this is to just allow POVMs in. Um, so um, I would have to. I have to look at that, but I, I think you can assume that. So <laughs> assume that what we're doing is we're associating an algebra of POVMs with each region. Um, Thank you. Okay, okay. great. Yeah. Um, um, right. So, um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, the yeah. Yeah. Um, this is supposed to be just for. Or, or type two type oh. yes. So everything I'm doing is all abstract, right? So I'm only talking about star algebras here. I'm not going to talk about representations at all. So the type, the type two, type one, type two, type three comes in when you ask about one moment algebras, right? Um, which will happen, right? If you once you we start going down this road, but I'm not going to get that far today. Um, but I'll say something about that at the end. Okay, so, um, okay, so the goal of this whole measurement framework is to um, represent everything, as I said, using HUFT. And here's the key strategy to. Uh, Keep in mind, the whole um, setup that I'm going to go through is just following every step that you find in Chapter Ten of Bush's book, Bush and Co-authors book. Okay, so you look at the you look at the steps, and then you know, like basically you can go back and go to the book and see they just did the same thing. Okay, so I think that's the key to follow what's going on. Um, so this is going to allow us to do as they do in Bush's book, derive a measurement theory for AQFT, and then include the state update rules. Um, Okay, but we need a key ingredient in order to set this whole thing up, which is we're going to, and this is actually the thing that makes the whole thing work, actually, this is the kind of key step. Um, so remember our scattering theory was so useful in not only mainstream QFT, but in the um, uh, Hogg and Kassler version as well of uh, AQFT. Um, so we're not gonna totally get rid of scattering theory, we're going to introduce a scattering morphism, but it's going to be over finite bounded regions. Um, so, uh, um, so 
uh, here is what that is going to look like. Um, so um, time goes up and K is going to be the region in which we have our quantum field theory described system and our probe um, interacting and they don't interact outside K. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be uh, setting up these scattering morphisms. Everything we want to be manifestly Lorentz covariant in a nice way. Um, so we're going to be particularly interested in the region M plus is going to be everything outside the causal past of K. So it's like everything that's white here. And then M minus is going to be the opposite. So M minus is everything outside of the causal future. Okay, so we're including the side cones in M plus and M minus. Um, S is just an example of a Cauchy surface. These are going to be important because we're going to be using the time slice axiom. And then um, L is just like some region, which is uh, to the future of K, partly at least. Okay, so here's what the scattering theory is going to look like. Um, so um, we are going to have the algebra for our coupled probe system. So that's gonna be the curly C algebra. Um, and so that is going to be great. Actually, that's going to be everything we need, right? So if we have one algebra, which described the coupling between our coupled system probe algebra, and we know what the state is over that algebra, then that encodes everything. It includes all, all of the measurement outcomes, it includes all the dynamics, it includes all of the, everything. Um, turns out that's not that useful, right? So uh, the reason why we're going to be introducing um, this the, uh, the state update rules is because that's not useful. So here's how the scattering morphism is going to help us with that. We're also going to consider the easier to manage case in which um, we have an uncoupled algebra. So this is where we have P, a nice algebra that's the algebra for our, our probe by itself, and S is the algebra for the system by itself. Um, and then you can combine them in tensor product. And so um, the key assumption is going to be that, uh, which you can show tools in, in particular models, is that um, C is going to be important and uh, relevant in this region K where the interaction is happening. But outside the region K, outside of the region K, i.e. in M minus and M plus, then C is going to be isomorphic to the uncoupled algebra. So, uh, and so the, then you have isomorphisms between regions like L, which is in M plus, um, uh, and uh, and C. So, essentially, I mean the scattering morphism is actually an isomorphism, but essentially what it's doing is it's a whole sequence of maps, and it's going to take you from it also maps past. To, I'm sorry, it maps future to past, like the opposite of you would think a scattering operator would, but set that aside. Um, so what it does is it maps observables in uh, associated with the uncoupled algebra in the future to the um, uncoupled algebra in the past, but it's encoding in this set of this whole big set of uh, isomorphisms the information that the coupled algebra contains about how the uh, probe and system are coupled. And uh, also, you're going to be able to get from past to future using the local embeddings, the dynamics that's encoded in the time slice property. Okay, so um, so this is going to be the useful tool which lets us set up um, the uh, the measurement theory. Okay, so then, as I said, we're just following all the steps in Bush's book. So uh, quantum measurement theory is um, going to then take the next step of defining a measurement scheme that defines a correspondence between the measured probe observables and the induced system observables. Then you're going to define instruments, and the instruments are going to help you to describe the system in light of measurements of the probe observables. So the idea is you always measure the probe, and then you're going to get induced 
um, uh, system observables that you're getting information about. And so the state update rules are going to be telling you how to update your state of the system given this information you have after you measure the probe. So FB measurement framework does the same thing for AQFT, except there's some differences between ordinary quantum mechanics and AQFT that are relevant. So we're going to use the scattering morphism. Uh, we are going to stick to doing everything with abstract star algebras. Uh, we're not going to use concrete Hilbert spaces like you would in um, ordinary quantum mechanics. And crucially, the way we set things up at the beginning is we associated algebras with regions of space. So this means that after you go through and you derive your state update rules and the whole measurement formalism, you can ask questions like, what is the minimal localization region for this induced observable for my system? So uh, the localization, the facts about localization regions are going to follow from this whole setup because we put them in at the beginning. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this, obviously. Um, they, uh, a few Sternberg go through and they set up the constructions and derivations by analogy to quantum measurement theory to arrive at the measurement framework. And in particular, we'll focus on the state update rules because those are philosophically interesting. So as I've already stressed, actually it could be done before you do anything, including set up the uh, scattering isomorphism because the global algebraic state over the coupled algebra actually contains all of the information about what's going on with the dynamics, gives you all of the predictions. But it's difficult to figure out what's going on with that state. We don't even have a tensor product of two algebras. So it's highly uh, um, uh, um, it, it, uh, entangled uh, um, object. And so um, what, we want is to have uh, omega primed, which is the updated state for just the system. Um, so omega primed in both quantum measurement theory and uh, in uh, the FE framework is the state over uh, the system algebra that assigns the correct post measurement uh, conditional probabilities for the system. And what it's conditioned on is the observation of some probe effect. Big B, which is in the um, algebra, uh, the probe algebra P. So here is the state update rule for non selective measurement. So, not, um, there's no uh, filtering conditional on which of the probe effects you observe. Um, and so, as you can see, um, this back here. Uh, omega cross sigma, sigma is the state of the probe. So this is the uh, sort of, you think of this as the state in M minus, the, the state over um, the uncoupled algebra in that region. Um, so this, we're assuming that as you normally do to do make measurements, the probe and the system states are uncorrelated before you do your measurement. Um, A is the induced observable in the system algebra. So that's the what uh, we're measuring in the system. And um, this is just the, the adjoint because it's acting on the states of the scattering matrix. Sorry, scattering isomorphism, rather. Um, so you can see that basically what you need to do this is the scattering isomorphism that we set up at the beginning. OK, so this needs interpretation. Here's where, if, if you lost me, Here's where I'm going to start talking about interpretation again. So what exactly did I do by setting up? What were they doing? I was them doing it, setting up the, um, the scattering uh, isomorphism. So here's what I think is the right way to understand the um, scattering uh, map that's, that's, and, and the state update that's playing the um, important role in all of this. Um, so we, on the one hand, we have a coupled algebra and the actual and the state over that algebra, which is the global state, right? So that's the actual state of the system at all times. But um, as we said, that's not convenient to work with. So we have introduced these state update rules for the purpose of being able to work with this thing. And so what are the states? 
well, I think this is not quite, this is kind of a rough way of thinking about it. Um, so remember time goes up, we start off in the, in the M minus region and we have a state uh, omega cross sigma, which is the uncorrelated state on the uh, initial uncorrelated algebra. Then something complicated happens in this, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the um, interaction region. And then we get a state again that we can assume some sort of state on U. So I've called the state nu. Um, so U is the uh, uncoupled probe system algebra. Uh, omega prime is like what you get by tracing out this nu, right? So you, that's one of the steps in the, um, in the scattering um, isomorphism. So I think the best way to think about the role that's being played by omega and omega primed is they're both global states, right? They're both states that are defined, well, they're defined over the, the global in the sense that they're not associated with time directly. They're only associated with time through this algebra, which is the uncoupled algebra, which sort of somehow represents the system and probe as like being uncoupled forever, but they're actually coupled because you're doing a measurement, right? So I think the best way to think about these is they're counterfactual in and out states in nice M minus and M plus regions because we want everything to be nice and Lorentz covariant. Um, but they're appropriate to assign to the system in these regions insofar as they generate the correct conditional probabilities for measurement outcomes. So again, I think it's worth stressing that the condition here is if you measure the probe, if you measure uh, B, you get B as a probe effect, then um, then you up would update to, in, uh, well, sorry, there's gonna be a selective one in a second, but if it was a selective measurement and you measure uh, probe effect B, then omega prime would be the right um, state to assign to um, the system by itself in the M plus region after you've done that. Um, uh, after you've done that measurement. Sorry, I mean, just yeah. a clarifying thing, comment or question. When it says in these regions at the bottom, yeah, I, would it be fair to say M plus is what you mean there? I mean, especially for omega dash subscript non-selective, you're thinking of what you just said suggests to me that it's a counterfactual uh, state of the system conditional right. on a non-selective measurement in region K. So the regions in the... So, line I mean, means... it doesn't really make sense to assign states to regions in yeah. this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this, this sense of, the reason why I put M plus here is the second part of this, right? M plus just means this is appropriate to assign to the... So yeah. omega primes trace out, right? So... Um, yes, so, yes. Okay. I mean, the other thing is that those algebras aren't actually arguments of the states. It's elements of algebras that are arguments well, of the states. Well, yeah. So this but, is supposed to be I, trying I mean, to be... you're trying to say yeah. omega tensor sigma has us considered as restricted to U of n minus, gives I, information about... And I don't think U we need to... I don't think we need to restrict it. I think this is not an appropriate... As you say, this is not an appropriate way to represent anything. I'm trying to give... to use this as a suggest suggestive way to um, track what's happening interpretation wise here. And so there's two pieces of the interpretation, right? So there's the counterfactual piece and then there's the probability piece. Um, so these regions are tracking when it's appropriate for you probability wise to assign these states. But I mean, it, you have the time slice, probably, right? So this is actually all of M. It doesn't make sense to Think about you just being on M plus, right? Because you have a you have a Cauchy surface that goes through M plus that gives you then all of all of M. It's just that we had these statements about you curly U and curly C at the beginning were that uh, happily in the uncoupled region outside K. C, which looked mysterious because it contained the coupling, was happily isomorphic to the corresponding U on an arbitrary region little l contained mm -hmm. out in, outside K. So I've been really hanging on by my eyebrows with that thought okay. to understand stuff like 
U on N plus, because it seems to me that N plus is a good example of your L before as a place outside K on which happily mysterious C of N plus is actually U of N plus viz a tensor product algebra. Um, Sorry, I, I shouldn't interrupt the talk, but you know. You, yeah, so you're worried about whether the isomorphisms exist in no, I'm just that's... struggling to. Sorry, I shouldn't go on. I, perhaps it'll be it all come up in discussion. Other people will have similar. So, anxiety. Could you, can I just ask a question related? Yeah. Because you've got new there on the right hand side of two. So you don't want the omega prime then? Well, um, so oh, omega prime isn't for new, it's for S. Uh, new. This is, I, I yeah, yeah. So, state. right. So, this is the, the whole uncoupled algebra to get from. Because I mean, yeah. we started with U, right? Um, and so, like, so what omega prime is, like, in usual terms, what you would get from tracing out the probe. And its relationship to new, then. Well, so this is why we do the whole big scattering thing. Trace. You can think of the scattering operator as doing both the dynamics and the tracing out. Because right. you have this combination of different types of isomorphisms, some of which are dynamical and some of which are isomorphisms between these algebras in different regions. Yeah, so maybe Jeremy, that this is supposed to be like capturing some sort of intuition rather than uh, uh, rather than like being something that's rigorously like, um, mm -hmm. and so in particular these M pluses, like you can extend to the whole space time. Um, so I mean that uh, C is our algebra for our coupled uh, probe and our coupled probe and uh, system. Um, and C is defined over all of space time, right? Um, we also have a state over that algebra for all of space time. So you can think of that as giving you all of the expectation values. For the probe, uh, for the probe um, system coupled like total system. Um, so that's everything that's actual is there. So I think this is a big difference between how we normally how, and actually I'm going to talk about this in my next slide. So maybe it's a chance to move on. But um, th this is a big difference between how we would interpret naturally, literally the state update rules you get in quantum measurement theory and what we've gotten by doing the relativistic version. Right, and just a question about um, Bush's framework. Um, yeah. I, I didn't think that Bush retained a quantum state for the system at all times, but you are, so I know. So that's another, yeah, so okay, so let me talk about differences then. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk about differences with quantum measurement theory, but let me go back to talking about differences with the operational interpretation that I started with. Um, and I can talk about that more in the um, in the question period. But um, so um, okay, so remember, Hogg and Kastler um, use the local algebras to represent the observables tied to local observables tied to the space-time region O, and also to represent operations that could, in principle, be performed on these open-bounded space-time regions. So how does that change when we? move to this FB measurement framework. Well, first of all, as I, I was just talking about, uh, talking about this, that an observable in an algebra on one space-time region can be localized in more than one region due to a couple of the axioms. We were talking about the time slice property as being one of those. You can go from M plus to M because there's a Cauchy surface for M in M plus. Okay, that's not a problem. That's just a fact, right? Okay, so this gets more interesting. Um, so, uh, so then you can ask that, okay, so sure, you can make the regions bigger, but what's the minimal localization region? Um, and if we're doing a measurement, we're interested in, for some observable A, which is our induced system observable, um, what's, if we measure the probe observable B, then what's the, uh, what's the, uh, lo the minimal localization region? And that's going to be the causal hall of the system probe detector region, which is what you would kind of expect, right? That's where um, that observable is going to be localized if where you're measuring it in, in, in that region, um, where your probe's interacting with your system. 
Um, and then you might wonder though, okay, what about the locality of, um, of operations, right? So I've talked about the locality of observables. So I think this is where it gets interesting to me. Um, so we've introduced a probe. Um, and so I think really the locality of operations is reflected in the fact that the uncoupled and coupled system probe algebra are only isomorphic outside of this region in which they're interacting. Okay, so um, I think that's really the assumption that's bringing in the locality of all. So maybe that actually helps you, Jeremy, think about some of the isomorphisms and what they're doing. Um, so you can't see the other thing I have there, which I think says, I can't see it either. I think it says dynamics, I think I'm guessing. Um, so, uh, Right, so remember the Heisenberg picture representation was supposed to be able to use to um, understand how the dynamics was being represented in the um, in the Hogg Kastler version, and then we have to have these algebraic state updates um, when we have external interventions of some sort. So here is what another way of saying what I just said, right? So, um, so well, when there is there are no external interventions on the system. Well, we have our uncoupled algebra, right? And we have a state over it. Um, they're, they're uncoupled if you, and if you have, uh, and so if, if this is a, uh, and, and so that, that could be something we would use to represent no external interventions. Um, then if you think of the probe as doing an external intervention on the, um, on the system, then really what's representing that is this um, global algebraic state over the coupled system probe algebra because why you introduced the coupled system probe algebra was to represent the probe's intervention on your system. Um, so again, I think it's important to think about how, what the state update rules are doing. Um, and so, uh, so, so for convenience, the state update rules are allowing these counterfactual states um, where we're pretending that there were no interventions to be allowed for the purposes of these con conditional probability assignments. Okay, so I have to talk about the measurement problem. So let me talk about the measurement problem. Sadly, I only have five more minutes left. So very great, um, but this is important. Okay, so, um, all right. So this is what they call their core result, and I really agree that it is an important result. So now we're gonna shift from thinking about non-selective measurements to selective measurements. And so we're gonna consider a sequence of selective measurements that we perform in causally orderable regions. And so there's going to be um, two measurements. And so you can, um, so if we think of, again, I'm using, so, so uh, if we think omega as being the initial state of the system prior to doing any of these measurements, so interpret these in nice, like the M minus of everything, um, then um, we can think about doing this in one way where we would do uh, one state update, say conditioned on, uh, selecting V1 in state omega, do a, then do another state update. So that would be a, the state condition on V2 being observed in state omega one primed. Or you could just do one big measurement, right? So um, you can uh, think about uh, doing just one update, uh, which is gonna give you the state that's con conditioned on V1 and V2, being observed in your initial state when you go. So the core result is that it's the same. That you get the same state when you do either a sequence of two updates, after, uh, do one selective measurement update, second selective measurement and update, or you can just do both at once. Um, so uh, the interpretation of this, um, is of course um, this is uh, um, th this is uh, a result for the states, but the interpretation that they give to this result, which I think is right, is it renders moot the discussion of where and when a state change of the system takes place as a consequence of the measurement. You have to do it one all at once, or you can do one and then the other. This renders moot mean needs to be discussed or does it mean dismisses as irrelevant it means dismisses as irrelevant yeah okay. yeah yeah i mean i like this terminology because it doesn't say there is no such it says 
why would you ask where it happens if you could do it one way or do it the other way and get the same result? Um, I think I have another statement uh, that they give in a second. Okay, so let's talk in the last couple minutes about very briefly about interpretive consequences for the form that the measurement problem takes in QFT. So this is the kind of question I'm asking over here. And as I suggested earlier in my talk, I think that this is interesting because the question marks can be different than the measurement problem as we know it from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, so to give you a taste, uh, and this is where there's a lot more philosophical work to be done by a lot more people other than me. Um, so here's one version of the measurement problem in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which latches on to something that was intuitive maybe at the beginning of the day. And of course, there's many different versions of the measurement problem um, on the table now. So intuitively, we have our unitary quantum dynamics, for example, given by the Schrodinger equation. We have state update. Say we're going to do that using Luter's rule with the eigenstate eigenvalue link, and then that gives you um, an inconsistency. So this FB core result entails that as part of this, you're going to have, of course, you're going to have uh, QFT dynamics. You're going to have the uh, um, the uh, FB state update rules going to be part of this. Well, at least the FB state update rules part cannot be sort of literally interpreted in terms of collapse in the same way that you can interpret Luter's rule in terms of collapse. Um, so um, to me, the underlying point here is that when we move to relativistic quantum field theory, we're going to have uh, well, this is a, the, F, the FB framework, AQFT. Um, it gives you an example of how to represent quantum dynamics um, in, a, uh, in a different way, and uh, also introduces different state update rules, which is then going to change the form of the measurement problem um, that, we, that we have in this kind of framework. So let me say one respect in which I think what I've already said is interesting, and then two respects in which, hang on, right? There's more to be said here. Um, so I'm not interested. Okay, so um, I think it's interesting to think about um, this particular question that I posed about what happens here when we consider how these two uh, formal pieces go together. Um, that being the, the representation of uh, RQFT, including the dynamics, especially the dynamics, and then um, how the, the measurement the theory fits on top of that. Um, so that's the interesting part. Um, the part that requires uh, more to be said is, of course, um, first of all, I'm only talking about the form of the measurement problem here. The thing that we're really interested in is, of course, how you solve the measurement problem and what the candidate solutions are that are on the table. Um, this is not interesting because I take it that I mean, so this comes from a very literal reading of what these ingredients represent, right? So you might think, okay, this is the kind of like on this literal reading, the easiest way to solve this kind of problem as we know would be something like a Wigner style uh, measurement induced collapse interpretation. Um, very few people think that that's a plausible way to solve the measurement problem. Um, so what I basically, what I've said here is this sort of core result um, is it, it, it shows that uh, measurement doesn't literally in, in, induce collapses, but then of course, even in the collapse domain of possible interpretations in response to the measurement problem with a whole bunch of other options, right? So I think in that sense, I'm gonna flag that what I've said here is, is very minimal in terms of what the implications are for the form of the measurement problem takes in QFT. In particular, I haven't said anything at all about what plausible uh, solutions remain when you start to think about what the measurement problem and how to solve it would involve in this kind of framework. Um, the second thing comes back to Rika's comment about what happens to type three algebras, which we all worry about when we think about um, AQFT. Um, so I also haven't said anything about superposition, but um, there's going to be there's going to be everything I've said has been at the very abstract level of just the star algebras 
but there's going to be more interpretive work to be done and various, um, which is not to say that it's not possible to do it, but there's going to be various interpretive difficulties that come in when you start to think about what superpositions look like and what um, concrete von Neumann algebras that answer to this framework look like. So that's another um, way in which this is like, I haven't actually said very much so far. Okay, so now let me wrap up. So I wanna remind you of some of the things I said at the beginning, which I think are still important even over an hour later. Um, so first of all, um, I think it's important for philosophers to realize that the formulation of a local measurement theory for quantum field theory is currently an active area of research. And that there's good historical, physical and practical reasons for why it's important right now in physics. And while I spent a lot of time trying to explain this one particular um, algebraic approach to setting up a new measurement framework for AQFT, I, I want to also say, look, there's a range of different approaches. Um, and I have actually done some work on that, which will be in the review paper that um, um, Maria and I are writing. And then here are the two initial interpretive conclusions. Um, so I think the first thing I said um, is that the standard you know, operational interpretation of AQFT that you get from hogging Hassler um, doesn't carry over to the FV measurement framework. Um, so you still have maybe local system observables that can be represented using these algebras of observables that are associated with, like if you figure, try to figure out what the minimal localization regions are in some cases. Um, but it's not any longer the case that the local operation lo local operation local operations are represented by these uh, local algebras of system observables. I think the locality constraints on the operations are imposed in a different way in this framework. And finally, the uh, interesting part, uh, the core result that um, the state update rules cannot be interpreted literally as representing a change of state in some region of space, space time, for example, across the Cauchy surface that, that's caused by this measurement or occasioned by the measurement. Um, I think it's also the case that there's similar interpretive conclusions, glad to see Dan nodding here, that come out of thinking about that, uh, in particular, the detector-based measurement theory, which is the one I've thought the most about so far, although I think you can kind of see how some of the histories informed approaches have similar kinds of themes as part of them. But um, uh, yeah, so I think that this is that these are themes that are coming out of other approaches as well. And finally, I want to thank Maria again, uh, who's been an excellent collaborator. Um, so uh, she will also be in Vienna next year. So she'll be she'll be in the neighborhood. Uh, I'll have a postdoc uh, there. Thank you.